Good evening, everyone who is on the Zoom line and the phone line. Thank you so much, Reverend Edwards, for our devotional introduction. I'm, I am counted a blessing today and a privilege to be able to join in tonight on our expectation moment while I celebrate my birthday. Uh, somebody said, you can take off tonight. And I knew Reverend Edwards was ready, but I just wanted to teach tonight on my birthday because I think it's just a blessing right. to be here, uh, to be able to, to teach the word of God uh, as I celebrate another year that God has given me. So I thank y'all for joining me in my expectation moment birthday party. So thank y'all for joining in with me, those of you on the phone line, on the Zoom line. Uh, we're continuing tonight, and I want to just pause to remind everyone that every day at 12 o'clock noon, we're having our Lent prayer. And I want to encourage somebody to make sure well, I don't have time. Yeah, you do have time. You got time to come on and pray. We're not praying a really long time, but each day the Lord gives me uh, different things for us to pray for our congregation and for us individually for. And I just like for you to join us, if you can, every day at 12 o'clock p.m., 12 o'clock noon. Uh, tonight, we're in the book of Mark, chapter 10. Uh, we're again grateful tonight that we have had this long sojourn in Mark. And I just want to just take a moment to highlight where we've come from. Uh, Mark, again, was a gospel account of the life of Jesus that was written um, to the Roman Christian. We know that uh, Mark got his information regarding the life of Jesus from Peter. Uh, we also know as well that uh, Mark made sure that he included in his gospel account the life in the life of Christ. The how do I want to say this? The action, the energy of Jesus's earthly ministry. Uh, Mark shows Jesus going from one place to another place. Mark shows Jesus teaching and preaching and doing miracles. Mark shows Jesus doing great and magnificent and powerful acts. Mark shows Jesus. Uh, doing things that nobody else could do. And as a result, I believe that his message or his his work or how do I want to say this, his um his um his those who were in Rome who had was in doing persecution and prosecution, I believe without question that they were encouraged by the reality of the actions of Jesus who is our savior. I, I believe that I believe that somebody was getting persecuted and they read this letter uh that it came in a letter form, this message that Mark had written to the church uh, and somebody felt better at recognizing the Jesus in which they had quite frankly gave up their old lives for to come into a new life. This Jesus was a Jesus who was operating on their behalf. And so that's why I think that, that, that Mark included more miracles than any of the other gospel writers. This is why I believe that Mark included the word straightway and immediately more than any other gospel writer. Now, let me take it a step further. I believe that today in the world in which we live, where there's uncertainty on every hand, where there's injustice on every hand. It's important for us to not just read the word of God, but embrace it, but also realize that the God that is the, the, the Savior, the Jesus, the Lord, that is depicted here in this gospel account of Mark uh, is the same Jesus that is available today. And somebody might say, well, no, Pastor, those are Bible times. And I say, no, Jesus, um, because he's the son of God, is the same as God yesterday, today, and forever. And so if Jesus was able to turn a situation around immediately, um, um, doing his earthly ministry, certainly he's able to turn a situation around today as he sits at the right hand of God interceding on our behalf. And so as we look at chapter 10, uh, all up until now, we've seen Jesus teaching. We've seen Jesus's ministry as it's now shifted from a Galilean-driven ministry to a uh, uh, Jerusalem-driven ministry. Uh, as we see him move from a place of, of miracles to a place of uh, preparing for his um, um, punishment, or I shouldn't say punishment, preparing for his suffering. As we see Jesus moving from um, large crowds to lesser crowds, uh, because people now, um, many have been healed, many have been delivered, many have been set free of demon possession, many of them has lives have been changed. And quite frankly, the attention span of the rest of the people may have dwindled. And, and I think that that's one of the challenges the, the church faces today, um, that the attention span of people diminish. Why? The people, the attention span of people diminish not because of just of time, but oftentimes, and, and, and I'm not speaking about St. Peter, and I'm going to be clear about this. Many times people get tired of just doing church, and we're going to see that in the text for today. People's attention span diminish um, when, the, when the action or the miracles or the teaching of Jesus had moved. And now Jesus is, and I want to be clear, in chapter 10, Jesus is really only talking to his disciples. And so those who are following him, and so the crowds had dwindled, not because Jesus had changed, but because many of them had gotten sidetracked. Many of them had gotten um, um, um how's the word, um, disoriented. Many of them have gotten disconnected, and so they kind of dwindled away. But guess who was still there? The disciples. Why? Because they had been called. 
let me say this. That's why as Pastor St. Peter, I don't measure church growth just by numerical growth because you can have people to come and people go. I measure St. Peter's strength um, by the faithfulness of the people that God has sent in the, in the mature growth and spiritual growth. And I think that's what I get that measurement, not from my own assessment, but I believe God measures us for our faithfulness. I remember very vividly, Reverend Davis would say, without any hesitation, that God um, watched our faithfulness, our diligence, our commitment to him. And so let us take that in consideration and let us apply that to ourselves. It's not just coming to church that's important. It's growing in the Lord that's important. And that's what we see now. The disciples are still there. Yeah, the disciples may have been a little confused about Jesus' ministry in chapter 10, but they're still there. They're still following Jesus. Yeah, they may have been unsure what the future held, but guess what? They stayed there. And that's what a disciple will do. A disciple won't um, get distracted and get uh, uninterested. A disciple, a disciple will walk with Jesus and stick with Jesus and stay with Jesus no matter what. Now, in our text for tonight, in the book of Mark chapter 10, we're going to pick up at verse 46. Uh, we see now that Jesus had one more miracle uh, that he was going to perform. And this is this miracle here now in the end of chapter 10. The Bible lets us know that Jesus is now on the way to Jericho. Um, and actually, he's in Jericho. He's on his way to Jerusalem, but in his process of going from where he was, Judea, to, to Jerusalem, there's a, a place where he comes through Jericho. That's what the Bible says in verse 46. And they came to Jericho. Now, we remember Jericho from the Old Testament. It was a city uh, that was fortified, a city uh, that looked impenetrable. It, it was a city that like it could never fall, but yet by the power of God, the walls of Jericho, dear what? They came tumbling down. And so this city was an ancient city, an old city. Uh, and here in Jericho, we see Jesus doing another miraculous, powerful act. Let me just point that out again. In, in the book of Joshua, the walls came tumbling down uh, simply by the power of God. Now here in the city of Jericho, we see another miraculous move of God take place. Let's look at this a little further. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, so they were coming through Jericho, and they were passing out on through on the other side. The Bible says, and a great number of people, um, let me read this, as, as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, his disciples were there, there was a crowd, but there was in this crowd a man named Blind Bartimaeus. In other words, within this crowd of people who were following Jesus, at least through Jericho, um, there was this man named Blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus was the son of Timaeus, uh, that was why his name was Bartimaeus, uh, and he sat by the highway side begging. Uh, again, this man appears to be like some of the others that we've seen, uh, some of the other people who were helpless. Maybe the man with the um, the four fingers brought, brought him to Jesus. He was helpless. He had been in this condition. It's not a, it's not um, given, but we do know that in this current time, he was um, helpless to a certain extent, not because of his um, ability to walk or talk, but it was his, his sight that put him in this situation. That's why I utilized this, the situation with the four men. This man needed some help. Uh, and as a result, he sat by the highway side begging. That's where he made his living. He did not have sight, so he couldn't be a carpenter. He did not have sight, so he couldn't be a tent maker. He didn't have sight, so he couldn't be a, a shepherd. And so he had to sit by the highway side begging. So if you can imagine him coming through the city of Jericho and on the outer walls of Jericho, on the other side of Jericho, as Jesus was passing through, he was sitting there waiting on somebody to leave Jericho or come into Jericho so that he could beg for them and, and, and beg from them. And so here's this man sitting there begging. And, and I want to just say this sometimes, you know, sometimes we find, and I, and I just believe, Reverend Edwards, this man didn't want to beg, but that was his condition. His situation was extreme. He was in a difficult spot. And I want to just pause. The Lord dropped this in my spirit. I want to drop it on you all. Sometimes when we in what seemed to be a difficult spot, we're right where God wants us to be so that he can bless us. Has anybody been somewhere where you were like, I don't want to be here, but the next thing you know, God opened the door that you wouldn't have got if you hadn't been where you were, despite the fact it was a difficult spot. Verse 47 says, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, this man couldn't see Jesus, but people were saying, oh, there goes Jesus, there goes Jesus. And so he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. The Bible says that he began to cry out. I like this. He heard that Jesus was near. Uh, he didn't ask for um, somebody to confirm it. He simply began to cry out. Why? Again, I think inherently in those verse, this verse is that this man had some level of expectation that Jesus could solve his problem. This is not the first time we've seen it. Um, other people have come to Jesus. And as they come to Jesus, um, we find that they uh, that encounter with Jesus is what's really transformative. What really changes the situation is the fact that they have an encounter with the Lord. And so this man just wanted to have an encounter with Jesus. I like it. I want to just look at it a little deeper. He began to cry out. 
and he declared, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I, I preached this once before years ago, but I want to look at these three elements. First of all, he cried out. In crying out, there was an intensity and an intentionality. He was crying out, not just making noise, but he was crying out to get Jesus' attention. Um, and that was intense. You know, the crowd is not just saying, hey, Jesus. He kept hollering and yelling Jesus. Why? Because he really, 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 really wanted to connect with Jesus. And the thing about intentionality, he was trying to get Jesus' attention so that he can have that encounter with the Lord. Now, keeping that in mind, the Bible says this. He cried out and he called out specifically to Jesus. He said, Jesus, thou son of David. Um, he, Jesus has been called the Lord, the son of man. He's been called master. But now this man pulls uh, and uses another name for Jesus, uh, thou son of David. In other words, this man indicated that he had at least a general knowledge of who Jesus was. He recognized Jesus from a, a, a Jewish sense that Jesus was, in fact, of the house and lineage of David. And as a result, he had some knowledge of Jesus. Now, let me, if I can, let me go a little deeper. This man understood that Jesus or believed that Jesus was the Messiah. That's why he referred to him as the son of David. And this man, it doesn't tell us his heritage, but if he knew enough to call Jesus the son of David, that means that he um, understood that he was the Messiah. And if he understood or felt and believed he was the Messiah, that means he had expectation of Messiah work taking place. The Messiah was promised to come and make things right. The Messiah was promised to come with basically the, with the power of God, with not basically with the power of God. And so this man said, son of David, Messiah, um, the one who sent from God, I'm calling on you and I, cause I need you to have mercy on me. The concept of mercy is, is of somebody uh, showing love and kindness to, so, to, so, to somebody who needs love and kindness. In other words, if somebody says have mercy on me, they're asking that person to show me love, to show me kindness. And instead of punishing me because of what I've done, Show me love and kindness that holds back your punishment and demonstrates your love and your kindness toward me. So he was asking God, he was asking Jesus for a love and um, love. He was asking God for love and kindness. That's what he was asking for. Now, at this moment, verse 48 says this. Many charged him that he should hold his peace. Now, I'm going to go ahead and bring that up today. Somebody says, shut up. Be quiet. Stop talking. Why are you bothering Jesus? They got loud. They really... They tried to shout him down because of him wanting to have an encounter with the Lord. Can y'all see that right now? This man wanted to get to Jesus, and they didn't want him to get to Jesus. And let me tell somebody, oftentimes, that's what the crowd will do. The crowd will do things to try to hinder your capacity or hinder your ability from having the encounter with the Lord that you really want. And I'm talking to save people first. Sometimes we can get so busy doing the crowd work that we miss out on the encounter we need to have for a transformative operation in our lives. Let me say it again. You can be saved all day long, but we all still stand in need of encounters with the Lord um, um, daily, if, if, if not every now and then, at least daily, we need to have an encounter with the Lord. And so remember that the crowd, and what's the crowd? The crowd is not always people. The crowd may be your job or what's going on in your life. It may be a trial or challenge you face. It may be that you're just busy being busy. It could be that you don't feel the best. Whatever it is, don't let any external actions prevent you from getting to Jesus. This man was crying out to Jesus. The crowd was yelling out, trying to shout him down. But the Bible says in verse 48, no matter how loud he got, they got, he got louder. The Bible says he cried the more a great deal. In other words, he wasn't going to be shouted down because he really needed to have an encounter with the Lord. He said, thou son of David, again, he says, have mercy on me. I said, that's what it takes to have an encounter with the Lord, a level of intensity. Sometimes we, we can be, we can call on the Lord. If we don't get what we want, we just leave it alone. But I came by to tell you that the Bible lets us know in the book of 1 Peter that we are instructed by the word of God to cast our cares upon the Lord for he cares for us. And let me use that. Let me use a example of how that works. I um, only fished a few times, Reverend Edwards, but I do know good fishermen. And one thing I know about fishermen is they don't just throw the pole in the water and just let it sit. If they don't get a bite, they reel it back in and they throw it again. A good fisherman might cast his, 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 his line out 20, 30, 40, 50 times, but he continues to cast it out. Why? Because he believes that that's, he's going to get something if he continues to cast. That's the same picture, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus is telling us. Don't just pray one time. Keep on praying. Keep on casting your cares upon the Lord. Why? Because he cares for you. He's never going to say that's enough or you've asked me too much. Jesus is not like us. Even a good parent sometimes 
Yeah, their kids get on their nerves. But thank God that our Father in heaven does not have the same mindset that we have in our human flesh. Because he's saying, I don't care how many times you cast, just keep casting your cast upon me. This man was deliberate and intense about crying out to the Lord and desi desiring mercy, love and kindness from the Lord. Now, I've read a lot of miracles, but this is my favorite part, verse 49. The Bible says, and Jesus stood still. You know why that's so impactful to me? Because throughout this book of Mark, we have seen Jesus on the move. They say he went to Galilee. He came back from Galilee. He was in Judea. He was in God. All the time he was on the move. But you know what got Jesus to stop moving? This man's cry for mercy. And I want to tell somebody else this. While you may be busy, if you cry to the Lord, you will do something that can't nothing or nobody else do. Why? Because God has love and compassion for his people. And if you belong to him, and you, and you have a heart for him, and you cry to him, he will stop moving to hear what you're saying. And let me say this to some unsaved person. If you're unsaved and you want to be saved, I guarantee you to cry out to the Jesus, cry out to the Lord, he will, stop, he will stop and hear your prayer. And what we're going to see next is he'll grant your petition. I love that, Reverend. That was he, he cried out, and all of a sudden, the Bible says Jesus stood still. Nothing has stopped Jesus from moving for 10 chapters except this man's cry for mercy. The Bible says, and Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. He told somebody, bring him to me. And the Bible says, and they called the blind man, saying unto him, be a good comfort, rise, he called it thee. That, that always makes me laugh. The same people who were telling him to shut up, the minute Jesus said, um, bring him to me, they said, hey, man, it's going to be good. Don't even worry about it. Um, Jesus is looking for you. But that's just how the Lord works. The Lord would take the folk who might have been trying to block you and make them into instruments to bring you to where he wants you to be. I love that right there. God is sovereign. Our Lord is sovereign. And he used the same folk who were trying to shut him up to be the vehicles by which he got back to Jesus. It said, be of good comfort. Rise, he called us to thee. And I, I wish I could have been there because I wish I would have liked to talk to this man. But this is what I believe happened. I believe when he heard that Jesus had responded to his request, when he heard that Jesus wanted him, the Bible lets us know that he does something that I, only Mark includes. Verse 50 says, and he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Oftentimes in Palestine, when there was a person that was uh, helpless or begging, they would use the cloak or a coat or a garment. The garment was used for a few things. Sometimes it was used for like a little pallet. So they could lay back on to be comfortable as they beg. Sometimes the, 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 the garment was used as a, a collection uh, uh, device where people could toss their um, their coins or their money into the garment. So at the end of the day, he could just kind of roll the garment up and head on home. Um, the, the garment may have been used to provide coverage for him because he had to sit out all day and maybe kept him being sunburned. But whatever it is, somewhere between his cries for Jesus, Jesus standing still, Jesus making requests for him, and the people saying, be of good comfort, comfort, get up, he calls thee. The Bible lets us know that they have moved to a place where there was such a level of expectation that he threw away his garment. Why did he throw away his garment, I wonder? Well, he might have thrown away because he knew he never needed again. Because if Jesus stopped what he was doing to make a request for him, he knew that he was going to get what he asked for. Maybe it was because he knew that he'd never be um, um, helpless or hopeless again, and he tossed it to the side. But what I do know is before he got in the presence of the Lord, he had cast away everything that would have held him back that will made him look back, that made him consider where he used to be, and he moved forward. And that's what I want us to know today. Sometimes to really get into the presence of the Lord, you got to cast away your doubts. You got to cast away your fears. You got to cast away anything that will hold you back. Because having an encounter with the Lord means you need to come with full expectation that he's going to do something godly in your life. I, I spent my whole life um, um, coming to this conclusion. One is I'm not God, but two, the God I serve is able to do whatever needs to be done. And so my dependence is not on myself, even my friends. My dependence is upon God because he has the ability and the desire and the wherewithal to do what needs to be done. And sometimes I got to cast my cares away in order for me to experience that which God is doing. I was talking to um, Deacon Brown today in my office. And one of the things we were talking about was how sometimes our mind uh, um, gets us confused. Our mind causes us to have fears and doubts that God doesn't intend for us to have. That our mind puts us in a position where we miss out on what God is doing. And as a result, 
of our minds, we end up missing out because we are hesitant to step out on faith and dependence on God. I told him a funny story that I'm going to share with y'all. I uh, hadn't gone into the basement of my house um, since 2018. I was afraid I'd fall down the steps. And I felt if I fell, I would never recover. And for, I want y'all to hear this now. Since 2018, so that's 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022, I was afraid to go downstairs. And, and last week, the Lord um, uh, reminded me that if he was able to bring me through what he brought me through, why would I be afraid that he was going to let something happen to me? And I decided uh, as a result of God reminding me that he was sovereign in God and reminding me that my mind was holding me back, not him. I was able to make the move to do something that I hadn't done in five years. My fear, which is in my mind, created a barrier for me. Some of us got fears that prevent us from stepping out and boldly coming to the Lord. This man could have just said, you know what, I don't even want to do this, man, because I'm going to go talk to him and I'm going to still be blind. This man said, no, I know when I get to Jesus, I'm going to get my sight back. So I don't need this garment. I don't need this cup. I don't need nothing because when I walk away from Jesus, when I'm finished, when Jesus finishes me, I'm going to be a whole new person. Y'all see what I'm saying? Don't let your mind prevent you from experiencing that which God has for you. Let's look at this next part of the verse. The Bible said he cast away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Verse 51 says, and Jesus answered and said unto him, what do you want me to do for you? And I like this. The blind man didn't start stuttering and said, well, I don't know. The blind man said, Lord, I want to see, get my sight back. That's what I want. I want to be able to see. And the Bible says, this, look at verse 52. Jesus said to him, go ahead and go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. It's only a couple of few occasions in the Bible, the New Testament, that Jesus makes this declaration. What made this man whole? Was the fact that his ocular nerves were uh, regenerated? No, that was the outcome. Was it the fact that perhaps his eyelids had been sealed shut because of blindness? No, that was the outcome. What the, what, why the healing took place was because he had such great faith in Jesus that he kept crying out. What made him have to get his sight back and what provided the vehicle for this miracle was because he believed that Jesus was the source of his, 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 his solution. What made him um, have get his sight was the fact that this man went to Jesus with such expectation that he had no doubt that Jesus was going to do it. What made him, what made this happen? Because this man said, Lord, I want my sight back. And Jesus said, you know what? Because you want your sight back. Jesus said this. He said, you are, you go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. And the Bible says, and immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. I love the way that Jesus did two things. Jesus gave him his sight back, Reverend Edwards, and then gave him salvation. Why? Because he followed Jesus. When we come to Jesus with intensity, when we come with enthusiasm, when we come not ready, to, not to being denied, when we come to Jesus and cast off all our cares and say, Lord, I'm putting it in your hands and I believe that you're going to do it, we will receive the breakthrough, the miracle, the deliverance that God has for us. And finally, our soul. This man got salvation, but our faith in God will grow when we have salvation as we come to the Lord in this way. So I'm glad to talk about Bartimaeus. I like all Bartimaeus. I love this story because it gives me enthusiasm. It gives me uh, more intensity on the deciding to cast everything away and decide I'm going to follow Jesus. I pray tonight that these words would just find their way into our heart, that we may be strengthened, that we we'll find our way into our heart, that we may experience the love and the power of God in our lives. This situation right here is a prescription that Jesus is ready to fill. All we got to do is follow the directions. God bless you tonight. I pray that God would bless you all with a great day. And I thank God for all of those who messaged me, has called me and wished me happy birthday. And I just pray that God would grant you the very best that he has for you in your life. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come this moment in time to say thank you for your grace. We say thank you for your mercy. We say thank you, Lord, for your peace, your joy, and your love. And I pray, God, tonight that you bless, again, every household, every individual Christian, and every believer uh, every family that is represented on this Zoom and the phone line tonight. God, this is what I pray. I pray tonight, God, that you would let your word get in our hands and feet, that we would be better equipped to serve you. Lord, let your word get in our hearts that we may be strengthened in our inner man. Lord, let your word get in our ears that we can hear your word and it will resonate in our ears and our hearts, Lord, that we will be postured to receive what you have for us. God, let your word get on our minds, in our minds, we might have peace that surpasses all understanding and that the fire does the same be quenched. Lord, let your word get on our lips, tongues, vocal, lungs, and throats, that we may declare your word to a dying world 
then to each other, and finally to ourselves. God, give us peace and joy again. God, I pray that you build a head of protection around us that the fire regards the same will be quenched. And then, God, beyond that, I pray, God, that you would give us love, the posture of prayer that we pray without ceasing, the posture of praise that we would give you thanks in all things, knowing that this is your will for those of us in Christ Jesus. Give us our capacity to rejoice in the fact that we have a right relationship with you in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we love you and we thank you. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hold on, Zoom line. God bless your phone line.